Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good morning. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Celia Menchel, Chair of the Club's member-led Middle East Forum. A special welcome to new members and a special thank you to Christina Nemeth of the Club's Travel Department for assistance with this program. The next Middle East Forum events are on February the 9th, we have America and Iran, and on February 23rd, we have Daughters of Kobani, a program about Kurdish women soldiers who bravely fought Islamic State with the United States forces. You can find out more about these and other upcoming programs and how to support the nation's oldest and largest political affairs forum at commonwealthclub.org. On a personal note, I would like to mention that today is the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And now I would like to introduce our distinguished moderator for today, Robert Rosenthal, a longtime journalist who was a foreign correspondent in Africa and the Middle East. He was the editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, the managing editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, and the executive director of the Center for Inter- pardon me, investigative reporting. Would you please welcome Robert Rosenthal? Thank you. I'm Robert Rosenthal, currently a board member of the Center for Investigative Reporting and Reveal. I'll be your moderator for today's program called War of Shadows. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished author and speaker, Gershom Gorenberg. He is the author of three critically acclaimed books, The Accidental Empire, The Unmaking of Israel, and The End of Days, and the author of National Jewish uh, Book Awards as well. Uh, he, uh, would you please welcome Gershon Gorenberg, whose book War of Shadows is a great thriller, code-breaking spies, the secret struggle to drive the Nazis from the Middle East. Welcome, Gershom. American memory of the war against Germany uh, during World War II tends to leap from the start of the war, Pearl Harbor, to D-Day, to We Won. And yet, for three years, more than half the length of World War II, North Africa was where British and then Allied forces fought Italy and Germany. And not only that, the real story of the decisive battle is a story of an intelligence breakthrough, which is either missing or extremely fragmentary in accounts of the war. The heroes of that battle, the intelligence battle, have been erased from the record and not by accident. To understand this, I want to take you on some time travel. Our first stop is in central Cairo on the 1st of July, 1942. If you were among the department stores and apartment buildings of a city built to be the Paris of the Middle East, if you were outside the inevitable L'American Cafe and you looked west toward the Nile, you see pillars of smoke rising from the British Army's general headquarters in the Middle East, from the British Embassy, from Royal Air Force headquarters, because clerks and soldiers are busy burning papers. They have bonfires of code books and secret documents. The fires are so hot that some pieces of paper don't burn up. They're lifted up by the heat and carried out over the city. That morning, a British code officer by the name of June Watkins finished her all-night shift in the RAF's code room in the basement of a downtown hotel. And she goes out on the street and she runs into a South African officer she knows who takes her to Gropie's Garden Cafe, a favorite hangout for British officers for coffee. But when they get there, the garden is closed. They have to drink their coffee inside. Uh, June goes down to the ladies room and looks out the window. And what she sees is that the garden is very active. There's waiters out there painting signs in German welcoming the officer of Erwin Rommel's Axis Army. Uh, The train station in Cairo looks like the scene that you might remember from the film of Casablanca, the eve of the German conquest, packed with people trying to flee. In this case, there's no rain, 
people are trying to flee south to Sudan or get onto the overnight train east to Jerusalem. The Turkish embassy in, in, uh, in Cairo sends a radiogram to Ankara and says, the number of Egyptian Jews who want visas for Turkey is increasing every day. What are we supposed to do? And they get a radiogram back that says, say no, uh, don't let anybody in. Uh, why are we reading these, these messages in English? Because they were picked up, intercepted, decoded and translated by Britain's government communications headquarters, the British intelligence agencies whose very existence was unknown to the public. If you saw the movie, The Imitation Game, you got a very inaccurate version of how GCHQ broke the Enigma code. They also broke the diplomatic codes of two dozen countries, including Turkey and for that matter, the United States. Everybody who was in Cairo knew that Cairo was about to face the same fate as Paris. Uh, to understand that, let's look at the map. Ten days earlier, ten days earlier, the German and Italian under army under Erwin Rommel had conquered the small Libyan port of Tobruk, uh, and at that moment, the British army appeared to be on the edge of collapse. In the next ten days, just ten days, a week and a half, Rommel's army advanced 350 miles to El Alamein on the uh, Egyptian coast, just 60 miles outside of Alexandria. Let's stop for a second and talk about Rommel. Uh, there's Erwin Rommel. Rommel was the most famous of the German generals. He was known as the Desert Fox. He wrote a memoir of his time in North Africa called War Without Hate, describing his uh, two years of commanding in Africa as just soldiers involved in a deadly game of war, a description which completely ignored the fact that there were actually civilians there. He gained a post-war reputation as being a good German. Hold on to that name and the thought of that reputation, uh, Rama. But we're in the summer of 1942. Let's go back to the map. Uh, as I said, people were trying to flee from Cairo to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem and, and Palestine were a very uncertain refuge. The distance from El Alamein to Jerusalem was barely more than the distance that Rommel had already advanced from Tobruk to El Alamein. The expectation in Palestine was Rommel is coming. This was frightening, especially obviously for the Jewish population of Palestine, but the meaning was actually extremely unclear. On the one hand, there had been a news report from London at the end of June uh, that said that seven secret information smuggled out of occupied Europe said that 700,000 Jews had been murdered by the Nazis in Poland, some of them in mobile gas chambers carried on trucks. And a couple of days after this, with information gathered from elsewhere in occupied Europe, the World Jewish Congress published a report saying that altogether a million Jews had already been murdered in Europe. And here's how the item appeared in the New York Times on page seven next to the Saks Fifth Avenue ads. This wasn't because the editors didn't think the story was important. It was because they couldn't be sure if it was true. Uh, and they were not alone in being doubtful. In a Tel Aviv Hebrew newspaper, an editorial ran the same day that said, these items, these reports, these numbers come as rumors taken from the air, passed from one informant to another, one writer to another. It's actually irresponsible, the editorial says, to be publishing these numbers because they cause despair and we have no idea whether or not they're true. Uh, so for the 75,000 Jews in Egypt and the half a million in Palestine, the fear of Rommel is not actually as great as the true threat that they're facing because they don't know that the SS is confident of Rommel's victory and in fact has already created a mobile killing squad, an Einsatzkommando for the Middle East. On the same day, July 1st, 1942, they appoint the commander this man, Walter Rauf, the man who was responsible for producing mobile gas chambers in Europe, his orders are to carry out executive measures against the Jews of Egypt. And once Rommel advances, the targets will be the Jews of Palestine and after that, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. To understand what happened next at El Alamein, at that point in the desert, we need to travel in time again. We need to go back nearly three years to the first week of September 1939 to the train tracks of Poland. And we're going to look at two trains, one entering Poland and one leaving. The first train left Berlin on the 3rd of September, 1939, two days after the German invasion of Poland, headed east into Poland. This is Hitler's private train. 
He wants to see the conquest. In charge of his security is his favorite general, Erwin Rommel. And Rommel proudly writes to his wife that he'd been invited to sit next to Hitler at lunch and that he, Rommel, was, quote, allowed to chat for almost two hours, unquote, with Hitler about military problems. Rommel writes, he is extraordinarily friendly towards me. Rommel worships Hitler. So I leave it to you to consider whether or not Rommel knew the meaning of German victories. Uh, Rommel, in any case, is elated to watch the invasion of Poland. It fits his idea, his uh, belief in rapid warfare, armored divisions breaking through enemy defenses. But tanks were not the only machine needed for that kind of warfare because headquarters needed to be in direct touch with commanders of tank forces who needed to be in contact with the units under them. The only way to do that was by radio, but sending battle plans by radio is the equivalent of shouting them out to the world. The German solution to this problem was a machine that was put on the market by a Berlin company in the early 1920s called the Enigma. It's a portable machine that looks almost like a typewriter. It scrambles messages. To decipher a message that's been sent, that's been scrambled by Enigma, you need another machine with the same wiring set up to the same starting positions, the same settings. The problem is, if you're not in the loop, if you haven't been told what the settings are, that there are 150 quintillion possible settings. And that's the small number, because the possible ways to wire the Enigma internally is a number expressed by a five followed by 92 zeros. It's obvious that this is unbreakable encryption, a phrase that you've probably heard about different forms of encryption in our day as well. So that's one train. The second train leaves Warsaw on the 6th of September, 1939. It's also heading east away from the German forces. And on board is the man who we could say ultimately defeated Rommel. That man, uh, virtually forgotten by history, is Marian Oryuski a 34-year-old Polish mathematician. 10 years before, when he was working on his master's degree in math, he was recruited by Polish intelligence's cipher bureau. And in the autumn of 1932, he was assigned to break Enigma. By January of 1933, he performed the supposedly impossible task of figuring out the wiring. And then he and two assistants found ways to find the settings. But as war approached in 1939, the Germans were changing the settings every day. Ryuski and his two assistants can't keep up. In July of 1939, they invite two British cryptologists, codebreakers from GCHQ to Warsaw and share their work. In September 1939, on that train, Ryuski escapes from Poland via Romania, reaches France, where he continues to advise the British. All of the British work breaking Enigma was based on what Ryuski had accomplished before the war. While Ryuski flees, GCHQ settles into its new location, an estate called Bletchley Park, a hideous mansion on the rail line between Oxford and Cambridge. And among the people moving in, well, one of them, you may be familiar with the name from the imitation game, is Alan Turing, a Cambridge mathematician. Based on Ryuski's work, he designs a giant machine that can run through Enigma settings looking for the one that could have produced a particular text. Also moving in is another Cambridge mathematician by the name of Gordon Welchman. He's an ethereal academician who, once he arrives at Bletchley Park, transforms himself into a manager, a master of world-changing technology. Besides coming up with the design that actually made Turing's machine work, Welchman's big idea was that code breaking wasn't academic work. It wasn't something for a genius alone in a small room. Welchman proposes turning code breaking into an industry dividing research from production, having people working three shifts a day. Bletchley Park goes from employing about 100 people when the war starts to thousands by the end. In our terms, it's a high-tech startup. In April of 1942, Welchman's crew breaks into the Enigma networks used between Berlin and Rommel's headquarters. And very quickly, they're able to decode this message from, uh, from Europe to Rommel's headquarters in Africa. As part of the appreciation of the situation in Malta, it is reported from a good source that the British will not be strong enough to justify an offensive before the 1st of June. This is incredible intelligence. It tells Rommel exactly how long it will take the, the, the British to attack, meaning how long he has before attacking himself. Uh, it's, this, this message is sent to the desk of a 24-year-old woman named Margaret Story. She was recruited to Bletchley Park two years before as an untrained clerk uh, recruitment transformed her life because 
Bletchley Park's success at decrypting German messages was getting into the nightmares of its commanders. They're thinking, if we're deciphering their messages, what if they're deciphering our messages? In the spring of 1942, Story is promoted to research specialist in charge of finding enemy intelligence inside of Enigma messages. I wish I could show you a picture, but Margaret Story left almost no trace in life but her work. It took me many months to find people who had known her. They told me, imagine her as a slight woman who always wore dark cardigans, who was always smoking. They told me she was uh, self-effacing, introspective, very intelligent, that she had daunting intelligence, that she had absolutely formidable intelligence, that she was shy, very shy, that she was the brain, that she spoke nine languages. Well, more messages follow, all of which go into Margaret Story's reports, messages from the good source in, uh, in Cairo. They tell British positions, plans, mistakes. Rommel's supposed sixth sense about what the British are planning is actually the best intelligence source that the Axis had during the war. And of course, the British need to know who or what is the good source and how do we stop it? Well, in retrospect, there's a number of suspects. They include the possibility that the good source was a spy brought to Egypt by Laszlo Almasi, the Hungarian desert explorer turned, turned German intelligence officer, uh, later turned into a completely fictional romantic character in the novel, The English Patient. Or perhaps the good source is or is connected to King Farouk of Egypt, age 22, known for his pro-axis leanings. In fact, he had learned in advance of the British invasion of Persia in uh, 1941 and had warned Germany. In February of 1942, the British ambassador engineered a coup to force Farouk to appoint a pro-allied prime minister but Farouk himself is still around. Who knows, maybe he's behind this leak. Or perhaps a British code had been stolen from a British embassy in Europe before the war. MI6's counter espionage chief, Major Valentine Vivian, had written a scathing report on security at the British embassy in Berlin before the war, about which apparently nothing was done. So who was the good source? I'm going to leave that mystery for the book and jump forward in time back to June 21st, 1942. Rommel has just taken Tobruk. His orders are to advance to the Egyptian border and stop, but then he receives a message from the good source in Cairo. And it says, if Rommel intends to take the Nile Delta, this is a suitable moment. Rommel is like a gambler who just got an inside tip. He invades Egypt. He has to reach the port of Alexandria to get supplies. He has to go beyond that to Palestine to reach the RAF, the Royal Air Force bases from which his ships will be attacked. He reaches El Alamein and there is the showdown. What happened again at El Alamein? I'm going to leave that for the details in the book. I will only say this, the victory in the secret war in discovering the good source is what was the key to the victory at El Alamein. And Rommel never knew of the role of Ryuski Welchman, Turing, and Margaret Story in his defeat. So why did this story remain hidden? Well, that is connected to an order that was issued almost at the very end of the war in Europe, 19th of April, 1945, to everybody in British intelligence who knew about the secret of breaking Enigma. And they were told, you need to keep this secret for the rest of your life. You may never speak. And a number of reasons are given, but the first and most important reason is that the Germans have to believe that they were defeated completely on the battlefield. They must not suspect, as happened after World, at World War I, they must not have any feeling that there was something happening behind the scenes that led to their defeat, because in that case, maybe they'll try yet again. So those who fought the War of Shadows are told, you played an extraordinary role in the victory, and for the victory to last, history must not remember you. Let me close with a couple of thoughts. The first is, this is just a small sampling of the intrigues that would shape the Middle East after the war. For instance, the 1942 coup in Egypt, which I mentioned, discredited King Farouk and was the catalyst of the 1952 revolution that brought Nasser to power. It's impossible for us to imagine how the Middle East would have looked if the battle had gone the other way. 
But certainly, were it not for the victory at El Alamein, the SS would have reached Cairo and Palestine. So I hope to have honored the forgotten heroes in the story, and I hope that you enjoy reading the full story. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gershom. Uh, uh, I'm Robert Rosenthal, uh, executive director, former executive director at the Center for Missing Game. I'm lost in the presentation. Uh, and Gershom Gornberg is the author of War of Shadows, Codebreaker Spies, and the Secret Struggle to Drive the Nazis from the Middle East. Uh, this is the Commonwealth Club program called War of Shadows, and now it's time for our Q&A. Uh, so thank you for writing this book. I, Gershom, I very much enjoyed it. It was a combination uh, spy thriller, history of the Middle East, and also, for my taste, a, a lot of... Uh, what I'll call science and technology, explaining the, how Enigma worked and all the codes were broken. So there's a huge amount of research here. Uh, and as a journalist, I was uh, having a tremendous amount of respect for your ability to pull together all the threads of this story with all the multiple characters. And I can honestly uh, recommend it. Uh, one of the things you did really well is pull, tie everything together by the end of the book. So every character you introduced sort of tied off with a ribbon at the end and and I really appreciated that but I'm really curious how you what what intrigued you enough to begin this incredible journey to tell this story it started with a um, lunch conversation in Jerusalem uh seven years ago uh a friend of mine told me that uh during World War II his father had been a British officer and the British army wanted to evacuate his mother from Palestine as they were doing with the families of officers because a Nazi conquest was expected so immediately. And as somebody who's written about and studied Middle Eastern history, I knew that that threat had existed, but I hadn't grasped until that moment just how immediate it was. So I started looking into that story. And as I looked into it, I saw the sort of scattered puzzle pieces of the, uh, of the espionage story that was behind what happened. And those pieces were uh, were distorted because a lot of it was based on memories that people had years after the war or rumors that people heard or people who had worked inside of very compartmentalized organizations who had been told fibs about what was going on elsewhere in the organization. And I had the opportunity to start digging it up because finally, all of these decades after the war, more documents have been released. Uh, intelligence documents tend to stay secret for a very long time. And so I was entranced. I, I couldn't stop. I had to put it together. So when, when, when was that? What year was that lunch? 2013. So how many years of research and then writing before you finished this book? I uh, was working for it altogether um, for six years or a little bit more on the book. So one thing, you know, in reading this book, I mean, you're basically taking us uh, from Cairo, as you mentioned, uh, to Poland, to escape from Poland, uh, Berlin, London, Washington, uh, Jerusalem. I mean, where? How did you pull together all these threads? Uh, you know, and and I and also Bletchley Park in London, outside London. Uh, what what was the trail that really? Can you describe a little bit of the trail and the sequence of your reporting and and what you were finding? Well, uh, there were three pieces uh, really. One was visiting all sorts of archives, a list that kept growing of archives. Uh, the British National Archives in London were crucial, but there were half a dozen other archives in Britain, um, the American National Archives, the FDR Library, collections of private papers in various places. Um, uh, there were also captured German documents that are kept in Washington that were microfilmed and kept in Washington, some, some uh, Italian documents. Um, that wasn't enough to put it together. Fortunately, uh, I was also able to find uh, children and grandchildren of people who had been involved in the stories who had some of those papers in their homes. Uh, and then the other thing that I would call a, a document, and I, I would like to say I was incredibly grateful to those people who had held on to those papers because some of those things had vanished everywhere else. 
Um, and the other document, as it were, was the landscape, the streets of Cairo, the streets of Rome, uh, which added to uh, the, the battlefield at El Alamein, which I needed to see in order to, to feel the story, the life of the story and put it together. Well, what, 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 taking the reader back through that period, the start of World War II, and, and really the uh, the success of the of the Nazis early in the war. Uh, but one thing uh, that really comes through over and over again was how much the other side, depending which side you were on, knew had access to information once codes were broken, and not only through what I'll call the technology. Uh, but the human sleuthing, but also spies on the ground. I mean, that, it was surprising how much in, information was actually available to each side. I mean, did that surprise you at all in terms of what I'll call espionage or what we would call cyber warfare today? Uh, you know, I was just so into it that it was it was less of a surprise that it was going on than where did it work and where it didn't. But there were things that became clear as I worked on it, which is that it's not just a matter of having information, because even once you got a hold of a piece of enemy information, there were all sorts of questions. Is it accurate? Uh, is the person who got it to you reliable? Uh, what about all the other things that you didn't see? And then you have to get this information to commanders who can use it, but they have to believe it and they don't always believe it. And you have to make sure that nobody else hears it because the contradiction of intelligence is it's only valuable if somebody knows about it, right? The, the information about what Rommel is going to do has to reach Britain's General Auchinleck in, in Cairo. But the more people who know that it exists, the bigger chance that the secret will be given away, right? So there's this constant contradiction between giving it out and, and and holding it back. And then there were situations where the where the intelligence was perfect, but the commander on the ground simply wasn't capable of, didn't have the forces to put it to use. For instance, uh, in the battle for Crete in 1941, the British were then reading all of the Luftwaffe's messages and it was an airborne invasion. So they knew exactly what the Germans were planning, but they simply didn't have enough troops to hold the ground. And when they lost Crete, they, there was a feeling like intelligence, what good is intelligence? It didn't save Crete for us. What they didn't know was that on the German side, Crete was considered a Pyrrhic victory. And uh, the conclusion was we should never try an airborne inv invasion again, because the Germans, of course, didn't know that the British had been reading them. Well, I think in one of the you, you, you quote the German general talking about it and reviewing uh, incredible losses of German troops in that uh, invasion. And I think he even says it's, it's as if they knew what we were planning. I think you, right. you say, and, and they, they obviously did, but uh, you know, one of the things that was also striking was when you did have intelligence at times, you had to be careful about how you reacted because you didn't want to let the other side or and frequently the Nazis know that you were breaking some of their codes. So you sometimes didn't take action intentionally. And I, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, this was a huge problem because you've invested this incredible effort. It seems miraculous that you've broken through and yet using the information can give away the secret. And there are two different examples I'll, I'll give of this, of, of, uh, of what was done. One thing was they were also reading the messages of the Italian Navy which was responsible for shipping supplies across the Mediterranean to the Axis forces in Africa. And they wanted to strike specifically the ships carrying fuel because it didn't even matter if the ships carrying arms got through. If you got the ships carrying fuel, then those arms wouldn't reach the front. So they would send out a reconnaissance plane exactly to where that ship was. And the people on the ship would say, oh, we were spotted by a reconnaissance plane but that reconnaissance plane was only going to that spot in the Mediterranean as a cover story for the intelligence. A more striking example is that in, uh, in the summer of 1941, Churchill gave a broadcast speech in which he talked of mass murder taking place in the occupied Soviet Union. And that was in fact based on reports 
that Bletchley Park was deciphering from the German police unit, units who were carrying out genocide against the Jews in the Soviet Union. Now, Churchill didn't mention Jews, but he mentioned that these atrocities were going on. And the German police changed their code. They said, somebody is listening to us. Now, fortunately, they changed their code to another one that was even easier to break. But it showed the tremendous danger of using intelligence information on a public level to motivate people because it was basically shouting to the Germans that, that were listening to you. Well, one of the things, you know, is striking and what you do so well in the book is you talk about having intelligence, not acting on it because of the fear of alerting the Nazis frequently that you were eavesdropping in a sense, and then people were killed. And, and the detail in your book is the actual police reports where they cite numbers of, of people they murdered. Uh, and exterminated. Uh, but the other other thing that I found incredible was sort of, again, the network, Italian information, Japanese information. Talk about, uh, was it purple? Is that what they called the, uh, the Japanese right. code? And, and uh, I'm jumping around here, but, uh, you know, how that was all intermeshed as well and, and what the U.S. did with that and how they were reluctant it really to share it with the British. So uh, purple was the American name for the Japanese equivalent of Enigma, a machine that totally scrambled messages. Uh, and the Americans were much more expecting war with Japan than with Germany. And American intelligence put its efforts into breaking purple. And in fact, in the summer of 1940, or actually September of 1940, they made the breakthrough uh, it, it, into, into purple. Um, and I, I have to say that one of the astounding moments in the, this was the Japanese diplomatic code, not a military code, but a diplomatic code. But in early December of 1941, the messages being deciphered from purple were saying, destroy your code machines, were orders to Japanese embassies in, in, uh, in um, Washington and in London to destroy their code machines, which is an obvious sign that you're about to go to war. So in fact, the information was there that Japan is going to go to war, but the diplomatic messages don't tell where they're going to attack. And I'm sitting in the British National Archives, which has stayed quiet. I mean, it's not just an archive, it's a British archive, right? And I'm looking at the communications between London and America where they're saying, uh, we're picking this up, are you picking this up too? And I'm saying, these people know that, that a war is about to start. And I'm looking at the actual communications and I want to get up and shout. And I look around me and it's like, you can't, you can't shout here. But the problem was that they didn't know where there was going to attack. So the United States, I mean, at the very top, Roosevelt, the top generals knew that Japan was about to go to war, but they were missing the crucial piece of information of where the attack was going to take place. I think you even cite in the book when this information was shared without knowing where there were U.S. installations in the Pacific. I think you mentioned the field teams, which were actually alerted. But at Pearl Harbor, they said we're too far away, basically, and it's not going to happen here. And of course, that's the really general and the admiral who were in command of Pearl Harbor were locked in their preconception that they could not be attacked and did not respond to the alert. They were yeah. sure that if the Japanese attacked, it would be in the Philippines or perhaps at the Panama Canal Zone. Uh, <clears throat> and that's another obstacle to the use of intelligence, which is that uh, you've broken the code, but can you break the preconceptions of the people in charge? Well, the other thing, you know, the book goes into great detail uh, in explaining the code breaking and Enigma and, and in your presentation, you showed I never knew how many zeros were in a quintillion or whatever. <laughs> but uh, but also there's there's human, what I'll call, you call carelessness, error. Can you talk a little bit about what was happening in Rome and how the Italian security, secret service, really secret security, SIM, I think it was called, how they were getting information? The well, the, the Italians were, um, did not have enough people on code breaking. They had some good code breakers, but it was a very small team. But they were very good at safe cracking. They were extraordinarily good at what in America was called black 
black bag jobs are, as the British said at a certain point, the best form of code breaking is a pinch, a pinch meaning a theft. And for years, the commander of Italy's penetration squad was literally walking in and out of most of the embassies in, uh, in Rome, stealing papers and in particular stealing code books. And that was an incredible, I mean, you steal one piece of paper, one secret report, that's an achievement. You steal a code book and you've stolen the supply. And that's what the Italians were doing. And they may have had the best intelligence oper you know, Rommel loved to blame the Italians for everything. Oh, I didn't take this point in the desert. It's the fault of the Italians. But in fact, the Italians had the best intelligence around based on their, their most successful secret agent did all of his work within, a, uh, within walking distance of his office in Rome. Tell us how he, remind me of his name and tell us exact, tell the uh, listeners really what you're describing. I mean, you give us the details. His detail. name was Juan Manfredi Talamo. Uh, Manfredi Talamo, uh, as I said, he was uh, the head of the penetration squad. What he did is he, uh, he recruited Italian low-level employees working at various embassies, the doorman, the cleaner, uh, the secretary, the messenger. They spent years carefully finding people and recruiting them. Somebody would be called into a meeting, they'd meet Talamo, they'd be introduced to him as, by any other name than Talamo. Person would be told, I can offer you this salary uh, if you wanna work for me. If you don't, you must never speak about this meeting. And the person's job was to make a wax impression of a key, to wait until an ambassador left a key to the door and a key to the safe lying around to make a wax impression of it, to deliver it to Talamo. From that wax impression, a key was made. The informer, the agent inside the embassy would say, this is when they go out to lunch, this is when they go out to dinner. Uh, and Talamo would come with the keys enter the embassy, open the, the safe, take out the documents, quickly take it to a photograph studio, again, within walking distance, very nearby, hidden inside of a working class apartment nearby. Everything would be photographed and within an hour or two, the code books or the documents would be put back in the safe exactly in the order that they had been when they had been taken out. And the other side never knew that they'd been taken. And with that, they were in business. They so basically had a tiny bit of 20th century technology copying with timeless cunning and stealth. And I think one of the mysteries uh, that you saw, you know, we explained was that, you know, the British especially were wondered how their codes were broken and they thought there was a mole or a spy and it turned out to be as simple as carelessness, which is a big theme, uh, human error, even in terms of the breaking of enigma and copying patterns. Uh, two messages being ignored. I know you said earlier in your talk you did not reveal the, I want to talk about the good source, but uh, uh, there's some characters in here that are just remarkable. And I don't know if you've been contacted to do a screenplay yet, but it certainly would make a fascinating movie. Uh, and I guess I will tip one, but tell us a little bit about Bonner Fuller. Sellers. Uh, Bonner Fellers was the American closest to the war in the Middle East. Um, and he's a, he's a fascinating character. The best characters in real life, as in fiction, are the people that are wonderful bundles of contradictions. Bonner Fellers had been close to Charles Lindbergh. He was an isolationist. Um, he was a brilliant man, um, extremely cosmopolitan, huge curiosity about the world. Uh, in the summer of 1940, he was sent to be the assistant military attache in Madrid. He gets to Madrid and he immediately gets orders. War has just broken out in Egypt. He immediately gets orders. Go on to Cairo to be the military attache there. He actually takes a train across Europe, crosses through Berlin because America is not at war yet. Arrives in Cairo and sets up an office as the military attache. And a military attache is a weird role because it's essentially an overt spy on an ally. 
your job is to gather information in cooperation with your ally. And as the war grew in the Middle East, and especially after Pearl Harbor, when America entered the war, Washington wants to know everything that's going on in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, they want to know what's going on because they want to know the state of the war, but also they're supplying arms to the British. So Bonner Fellers is the man that can tell you whether or not the new Grant tank is performing well in the field. Uh, he's the man who can tell you what tactics are working and what tactics are not working. Uh, he, he's the person who can who can essentially tell the War Department how to get ready to fight the Germans and the Italians. And he goes from being this isolationist to being an extremely strong advocate of America fighting in the Middle East. And in fact, his opinion was adopted because the first place that America went to war in the West was in 1942 when it invaded uh, Morocco and Algeria to close in on the Axis from both sides. The British are advancing from Egypt. Mm -hmm. The Americans with British forces are advancing from Western North Africa toward Tunisia. And then from there, they went to, uh, to Italy. And his opinion appears to have been uh, one of the major things influencing FDR's, Franklin Roosevelt's decision to start the invasion there. Mm -hmm. there What's even there funnier about this, it, what's even funnier about this is that Fellers despised Roosevelt. He was yeah. very, very conservative politically, didn't like Roosevelt, but Roosevelt listened to his opinion. Well, one of the things, you know, that, uh, you know, this is on a very theoretical level, we, we can talk about how information was used, but if I understood it correctly, you know, the quote unquote good sources, uh, information was seen by the British, by the Americans, by the Germans, I think the Italians. And, you know, there was one incident you go in great detail about a raid uh, that was planned by British intelligence where they were going to, they actually commandeered Nazi uh, equipment, German equipment, uniforms, created a commando unit of German speaking uh, 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 Palestinians or German refugees, Jewish, some of them for commando raids into uh, German controlled territory in what I think is now Libya. Uh, and and right. there was information saying this was gonna happen to the really go after destroy aircraft. Tell us the outcome of that raid and describe sort of how the information was used by the Germans. Well, uh, the, the background of the situation was that one of the most strategic points in the war was the island of Malta, which lies uh, between uh, Tunis and Italy, um, and was a British possession and essentially a giant stationary aircraft carrier in the middle of the Mediterranean for attacking Italian shipping. And the Axis was besieging it, preventing supplies from reaching there, and the British wanted to get a convoy through. And they said, the only way we can get this convoy through is by destroying a lot of German planes in advance. So we're going to send commandos who are going to cross what's supposedly uncrossable desert. And they're gonna reach the Luftwaffe uh, air bases in Libya and blow up lots of planes. And through the good source, the British, I mean, the Germans and the Italians got wind of this raid and were expecting the commandos. And everywhere in Libya, the raids essentially failed. They were also, there were also commandos who reached Crete by submarine and were back to, you know, the commanders paying attention. The commander of the air base in Crete, the German commander of the air base in Crete ignored the warning and in Crete, the commandos succeeded in destroying a lot of German planes. But the plan, the plan to ground the German air force failed and the convoy to Malta failed as a result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, because how, of this one leaked piece of information. Well, that that is the, the amount of information, as I said earlier, that was that you people had foreshadowing about or knowledge about, and how you described it was either ignored, accepted, or not paid attention to. Uh, but I just want to remind our listeners: we're listening to Gershon Gorenberg, whose book *War of Shadows*. I heartily recommend, and this is the Commonwealth Club of California. Uh, 
we're getting close to the end. We're not quite there, but can you talk a little bit? I don't know if you've thought about this, the use of intelligence in today's world. This is sort of a question from an audience member uh, and how it's either obtained and the differences uh, or their lessons from World War II and, the, and these early technologies around what I'll call espionage and how you, with social media, social networks, how do you see analogies today or not in terms of that way information? I think that, I think that the lessons are incredibly strong because it's true that the technology, compared to the technology we have today, Enigma is, you know, a um, flint hammer, is, you know, Stone Age. But the crucial breakthroughs to Enigma the perfect coding machine were based on the fact that were, the flaw was human beings. There were two kinds of human flaws that made Enigma breakable, that made it possible to get in. One was the people who invented it were so certain of the way that they looked at it that they couldn't imagine somebody else looking at the problem another way, which is a classic human psychological flaw. So Marion Ryusky looked at the problem in a different way and found his way in. The second problem with it was you had lots and lots of people using this. And in order to maintain security, you had very strict rules. Well, human beings don't stick to strict rules. And if you want to look, for instance, at the recent scandal about the alleged Russian break into all sorts of American computers, you're seeing the same kind of thing. There's fantastic encryption. There's all sorts of rules. And people get careless. Somebody uses a password that's too simple. And you think, why would somebody do that? And then you think, you know, my bank tells me to change my password every six months and I can't remember it. And so I write it down on a slip of paper and leave it on my desk, right? And there it is sitting. Or I think of a password that I can remember, like the name of the company, which is a password that somebody else can guess. So the technology is amazing. But the human beings are the same human beings, and the human beings are the chinks in the system through which other human beings can get in. And I would postulate a rule here, which applied to Enigma and applies to today's technology. And it's the same rule for locks and for codes, which is that any lock that one human mind can invent, eventually another human mind will find a way to unlock it. And any code that one human mind invents, somebody else looking at it differently, finding carelessness is gonna find a way in. So when somebody tells you the encryption is perfect, it's time for a wry smile and a lot of carefulness. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one thing that I found fascinating uh, and sort of is along a similar theme which you may think you, you're covering your bases in one place, but. Can you get into the role of, I think there was a Japanese foreign minister, I believe, and the Japanese military, military attache. You describe how they visited Normandy and the coast of France in the preparation for the buildup of what everyone knew was coming, which was going to be the invasion of Europe. And for the Nazis, it was where? Where will the Allies land? And obviously it was a huge secret and they never understood where. But talk about the role of the way that happened. And because I found that fascinating and never would have thought of that, that the role the Japanese had in terms of yeah, this is getting off the allies to what was happening in the role of purple. So this is where you're really talking about it being a world war, everything being connected to everything. So the Japanese had an ambassador in Berlin and a military attache and a naval attache. They didn't know that the ambassador's code, which was purple, had been broken by the Americans. They didn't know that the military attache's code had been broken by the British. I can't remember which one had broken the naval attache's code. But all three of them went to visit the Atlantic Wall, defenses along the French coast, and sent back book-length radiograms to Tokyo, describing what the Germans were doing to defend Europe from an, uh, an Allied invasion. And all of those reports were read in Britain, were intercepted and read in Britain in the United States and were astounding intelligence for uh, American and British planners as they got ready to launch D-Day. So it was actually the breaking of Japanese codes 
that was a crucial key to defeating the Germans in Europe. Yeah, and again, I mean, we, you you bring us through, you know, many cap Rome, Cairo, Berlin, Tokyo, really, uh, Washington, London, and so you really see that connection, uh, and also how intelligence ignored. Uh, Tell us about the cryptic message Churchill sent Stalin, which was oh, fascinating. So this is uh, to yeah, see. So, so one of the Enigma networks that the British broke into was the was the German railroad Enigma network, and in the spring of 1941, they start seeing all these messages of trains carrying essentially the preparations for an invasion moving east through occupied Europe toward the Soviet border. And uh, now at this point, the Soviet Union, because of its not uh, non-belligerence pact with, uh, with Germany, is seen as practically being an unofficial member of the Axis. But despite that, Churchill sends a message through his ambassador in, 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 uh, in Moscow warning Stalin in very careful language that we have reliable information, he can't say how, that the Germans are gonna invade. And Stalin is completely certain that this isn't going to happen. And he thinks that it's a British conspiracy to destroy his alliance with Germany. And he ignores the warning. Uh, a, uh, as he ignored warnings from people from his own intelligence, and that refusal to change his conception, of course, of course cost the lives of millions of Soviet uh, civilians and soldiers when the, when the Germans invaded. Well, I think, again, what really comes through over and over again is how when intelligence is used well, ignored, or not believed, uh, you know, the consequences. Uh, in fact, uh, without giving away too much, I mean, you really, Rommel uh, in North Africa, and Rommel also, wonderful detail in the book, uh, is the fact that, because they had so little insight into the U.S. that Rommel was in charge, or not in charge, but involved in the defense of Normandy, and he actually went home for his wife's birthday the day of the invasion, and had to rush back. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, how intelligence is used or and misused, and the in the book, you describe brilliantly how Rommel, in terms of a lot of his success, was based on, in a sense, being able to see what the British exactly were planning, numbers of troops, tanks lost, et cetera, the fuel issues. But then when that window was shut, purely by chance in a way, I mean, not simply chance, but finally an issue, the order was followed to change the codes, what happened, which was this disastrous outcome for the Rommel in North Africa, that that sense he was blind and the hope that information would come. Did, that, did you find that surprising in your research? That that window was, happened, uh, happened? Yeah, I mean, I had, I had an idea when I started that the source had been cut off. But what was incredibly striking, you know, I, I, one of the big questions, you know, like written up on my whiteboard in my, you know, above my desk is, when did it stop? It was crucial to know, you know, there's a, there was this window of, of the week and a half between Tobruk and, and El Alamein. It was crucial to know literally what day of the week the information stopped. And the information stopped by, by piecing together the, the German and the British and other documents, I was able to determine within a day or two of when the information actually stopped. And what, what happened was, that Rommel had the source when he invaded Egypt, and he did not have the source when he reached El Alamein, and he was completely taken by surprise by the British defense there. He thought it was going to be a skirmish, and instead he was met by this really uh, tenacious and well-planned British defense at El Alamein. And the fact that the information cut out at that moment was totally crucial to the outcome of the battle. And he, and there, he, in a sense, he walked into a trap he described so well, but the British knew what was coming, but they weren't sure how much Rommel knew. They just knew he was getting, somehow getting a lot of information. They didn't realize well, they, what that. They, they, what, they, what they didn't know until the last minute, and 
and perhaps until afterwards was, has the source stopped? Uh, they knew that there'd been a source. They're not seeing the source now. Is that because we're not seeing it or because the source has stopped? As the battle developed, it's very clear that Rommel no longer had this, you know, six foot tall pipe pouring information into his headquarters when he got to LLMA. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have only uh, time for one more question uh, as we're running out of time. And, I, you know, I'm going to try and bring us to the present moment uh, into a recent event and get your either speculation or maybe you have informed knowledge. Uh, there are a couple of questions about recent high profile, really assassinations, uh, the, the Iranian nuclear scientists. General Qasem, you know, Soleimani in, in, in Iran, uh, I'm sorry, in Baghdad uh, last year. What, what, what do you, and when you look at those incidents, Gershom, with, from your knowledge now, and even from probably some of your people you know uh, in the intelligence world, what do you think that intelligence is based on? Is it both on the ground, intercepts? What, what, how do you, how, what's the most effective thing today when you do these kind of- Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, one thing with a great deal of caution and then explain the caution. I think that uh, that particularly in today's world, technological espionage is incredibly important because we're so dependent on the technology and there are so many ways that it can be intercepted and there's so many places where human carelessness can create an opening. But I'm also gonna say this, I, before I started writing history, I was a daily journalist. And I would see reports of, you know, what intelligence officials and diplomats told journalists. And the first time that I looked at diplomatic papers that had been released 30 years after the event and compared them to what had been in the newspaper at the time, I said, wow, this is, this is upsetting to me as a daily journalist because we had no clue what was going on. And then it sunk in even deeper that what we had heard, well, let me put it this way. When a intelligence source tells a journalist that something happened, he or she could have many reasons for telling us, the journalists, that information. It being true is not high on the list of reasons to tell us. So then 30 years later, something gets released and you rewrite the entire story. And on the story I'm telling you now about World War II, I saw stuff that was written 30 years later when say foreign office documents came out. And then 60 or 70 years later, intelligence information comes out and you say, wow, that story was wrong too. So for me to tell you what was involved in intelligence in something that happened a few weeks ago, I can only tell you that after doing this kind of work, it gives me a great desire to live a very long time so that I can see the papers when they come out. And uh, thank you very much for your wonderful questions and for this wonderful conversation. Well, thank you. And thanks to Gershom Gornberg, a journalist and author of War of Shadows, Codebreakers, Spies, and the Secret Struggle to Drive the Nazis from the Middle East. Now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 117 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>